morning H back team. So we're gonna move along into chapter 15, which is about metering devices. So a quick review on what the metering device is. It's the other dividing point in the system. You have two dividing points in your system, uh, dividing the high side from the low side of the system. Uh, the, uh, one of those dividing points will be your compressor. That's where the system goes from the low pressure to high pressure. And then the other dividing point will be your metering device going from uh, high pressure to low pressure. Now, uh, one of the reasons why this is significant, these pressure changes are significant, is because you're trying to remove heat on one end of the system and you're trying to absorb heat on the other end of the system. And the way that that happens is simply by temperature difference. Um, second law of thermodynamics, <laughs> it's going to be burned into your memory because uh, it applies every day to what we do. This is what we do. Uh, so the second law of thermodynamics says that heat energy travels from hot to cold. So if you want to remove heat from something, then that something needs to be hotter than the thing that's uh, absorbing the heat or the thing where, where we want to remove the heat at and vice versa. If I want to absorb heat, like if I, me, myself, if I want to absorb heat, then I need to be colder than the air around me so that I could absorb the heat in the air because heat's going to go from hot to cold. So with that being said, if we're absorbing heat at the evap coil, because that's what the evap coil does, then we need that pressure drop to take place, making sure that the temperature, because when the pressure of a substance goes down, as does its temperature. So the we reduce the pressure in the, um, so the, the, uh, the metering device is where the refrigerant pressure is reduced, also reducing its temperature, making sure that that refrigerant in that evap coil is colder than the medium that is trying to absorb heat from, which would be the return air, which is the air being sucked out of the room. So that pressure drop is necessary because we want the um, temperature to be lower than the, uh, the space that we're trying to cool so that we can absorb the heat. The same thing's happening on the, happening on the opposite side of the system with the compressor. The compressor is increasing the pressure because now we want the outdoor ambient temperature to actually be cooler than the temperature of the refrigerant inside of the condenser. So the compressor is increasing the pressure, thus increasing the temperature of that refrigerant. So now the refrigerant that's circulating through the condenser coil is warmer uh, than the air, the ambient outdoor air, which is how we can accomplish the heat transfer. The heat in the heat energy in the refrigerant is, is, is there's more heat in the refrigerant than there is in the ambient air. So heat travels from hot to cold. So that's how that takes place outside at the condenser. The opposite is happening in the evap coil. Um, the coil is cooler than the air uh, around it. So anyways, uh, let's start talking about metering devices. Do a quick screen share. All right, so chapter 15, metering devices. Objectives, <clears throat> list the different types of metering devices. Explain the difference in operation between fixed and modulating metering devices. Describe how to, uh, sorry, <laughs> describe how to measure superheat. Explain the purpose of liquid distributors. Explain the difference in operation between conventional and balanced port uh, expansion valves and discuss common metering device problems. So a metering device controls the flow of refrigerant to the evaporator. It separates the high pressure side of the, it separates the high pressure side from the low pressure side. The pressure and temperature of the outlet of the metering device corresponds to the saturated uh, condition required to establish the desired evaporator temperature. So you got different types of metering devices. Uh, metering devices are selected by application. They are they can generally be classified as belonging to one of two groups: fixed metering devices and modulating metering devices. Fixed metering devices are simple. Uh, yeah, are simpler and less expensive than modulating metering devices. Modulating metering devices have the ability to 
uh, respond to changes in system operation. So basically load changes, modulating uh, um, metering devices can change based on the load change. So if there's an increased load on your evaporator, then it, it can allow more liquid refrigerant into your evaporator. And if, it, and if the uh, load is reduced, then, or less heat you know, on your evaporator, less of a heat load on your evap coil, then it will allow less liquid refrigerant to enter into the evap coil. Because <clears throat> what it's trying to maintain is the superheat. And your superheat is the, the temperature difference between the refrigerant itself and its saturation temperature, the temperature of the refrigerant and the, temperature and the saturation uh, temperature. So the superheat being correct is ensuring us that we're not sending any liquid back to our compressor. So letting too much liquid into the evap coil you run the risk of sending liquid back to your compressor. Not allowing enough refri liquid refrigerant into your evap coil, you're gonna have, your, your refrigerant's gonna boil off too quick. Now your superheat's gonna be too high. It's gonna act as if the system is low on refrigerant, which it probably is unless there's some other issue um, causing that to happen. But your, your, your superheat or your subcool is telling you your, your, that's how you confirm your refrigerant levels are correct by checking your superheat and subcool. And the uh, modulating types of uh, metering devices allow you to ad make adjustments for load changes while maintaining the correct superheat, which is why fixed uh, metering devices, fixed bore or fixed orifice metering devices are critical charts. Uh, what that means is the amount of refrigerant in there is critical. If you're a little over or a little under, um, that's going to be exploited a lot easier on a fixed metering device rather than a modulating metering device that can adjust for those changes. So if it's a little bit overcharged on a TXV system or a modulating uh, metering device system, it can dial back the amount of liquid it allows in. But on a fixed orifice metering device, it is what it is. It, what, however much refrigerant is in there is going to determine how much liquid goes into there because it can't modulate. It can't change its diameter or length just because there's more refrigerant coming in. Once that thing is uh, manufactured, that's, that's, that's it. So it's, it, it's really critical to make sure you have the correct amount of refrigerant in there so you don't flood your compressor or starve your evaporator. So metering device operation. A metering device is a type of restrictor placed in the liquid line between the condenser and the evaporator. This produces a difference in pressure between the high side and the low side of a refrigeration system. Refrigerant that evaporates as the result of a pressure drop is called flash gas because the liquid turns to vapor instantly in a flash. The temperature of the warm refrigerant liquid must be reduced before it can be uh, before it can absorb heat in the evaporator. The pressure of the refrigerant is reduced as it flows through the metering device. The drop in pressure causes a small portion of the liquid refrigerant to vaporize, cooling the remaining liquid. So that flash gas is what happens is immediately as the refrigerant passes through the metering device. So you have 100% uh, gas coming into the metering device. And then, I'm sorry, you have 100% liquid coming into the metering device. And then 25% of that liquid flashes into a vapor on the uh, outlet of the metering device. So that line between the metering device outlet and the uh, evaporator coil inlet, that line is considered the transphase line because the refrigerant is in, 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 in two phases at once in that line. It's 25% um, vapor and 75% liquid. So that's what's inside of the transphase line. That line gets left out of the conversation a lot of times and then whenever it is brought up or if it's thrown at you at a test, then you caught off guard a lot of the time, at least I used to be. 
Um, Cause it's not talked about. You talk, you talk about the liquid line and suction line all the time. And then sometimes they mention the, uh, when you're, when you're doing your mechanical diagrams, they, they, they always label the discharge line, they label the suction line, they label the liquid line, and not all the diagrams always label the uh, transphase line. But that is the line between the, the uh, metering device outlet and the evaporator coil inlet. That is your transphase line. And the moment that that liquid refrigerant is restricted, um, some of the some of the uh, liquid flashes into a vapor. So, fixed metering devices. There are two types of fixed metering devices: capillary tube and fixed orifice or piston or flow rate or piston. Um, fixed restriction metering devices operate best where the load is nearly constant. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. In, um, in applications where the load doesn't change a whole lot, fixed metering devices will work just fine. But if it's an application where there's constantly different loads, you know, things are changing a lot, um, you might want a modulating uh, metering device. And that, th those decisions are made by the manufacturer, not by the technician. I mean, I've never changed a metering device, not that you couldn't. But every time I change one, I change it. I, I replace the defective one with a new one of the same exact type. Um, I've never said, you know what? I had enough of this capillary tube. I'm putting in a THV. Um, it's, you know, not that it can't be done. But I tend to stick with the manufacturer's specifications whenever I'm working on anything. Because the last thing I need <clears throat> is to spend all my time diagnosing a problem and then fix the problem just to find new problems in the future because I improvise rather than sticking to the manufacturer's specifications. So um, every time I've replaced a metering device, I replaced it with the exact same type that was already there. Uh, so anyways, moving on. <clears throat> Capillary tubes. Well, first, let me backtrack. So the, the piston, the flow rater piston, um, it's just a tiny little it's just a little orifice. It's just a hole. It's like a little brass fitting with a little hole in it, and it restricts the refrigerant to a specific amount, and that's it, which, which again, works best when its refrigerant level is correct, because it's not like if you have a whole bunch of extra refrigerant going through there, that it, it's not like that diameter of that orifice can close a little, like, oh, wait, that's too much. It's just going to let it in. So that's why again, why a piston would be considered a critically charged metering device <clears throat> or a fixed metering device system would be considered a critically charged system. Capillary tubes are the same way, <clears throat> different. Uh, they're made differently, same principle. Uh, so capillary tube is constructed of a seamless copper tube with an inside diameter ranging in size from 0 0.026 inches to 0 0.090 inches. Capillary tubes depend on their length as well as their diameter to determine their total restriction. So they restrict refrigerant um, by, by the size of the capillary tube. So whatever size that liquid line is, is going to get restricted to the, whatever the size of the capillary tube is. Plus the length of the capillary tube also uh, factors in to the uh, pressure drop. So increasing the diameter or decreasing the length of the capillary tube decreases the pressure drop uh, through it, which increases its capacity. Or decreasing the diameter or increasing the length of the capillary tube increases the pressure through it and decreases its capacity. So basically, if you make the orifice smaller or if you make the length longer, then that's gonna be more of a restriction. And it's gonna give you less capacity. And if you do the opposite, it's gonna be less of a restriction. It's gonna give you more capacity. And again, I can't stress enough on those types of uh, systems that use those types of TXVs, the charge is critical. Because however uh, wide or however narrow the inside diameter is, it's a fixed um, size. It's not gonna change because you added or removed refrigerant. Um, Sorry, I'm just making sure that I am not late for this meeting. Okay, so moving on. 
installing capillary tubes. <clears throat> the best sizing procedure is to replace the capillary tube with exactly the same size and length. Care must be taken when cutting and soldering capillary tubes. You definitely do not want to kink or pinch the uh, the capillary tube, or your metering device will not operate. It just that's a restriction, and your system will not work. Um, so file a groove all the way around the tube when cutting. <clears throat> sorry, when cutting it, <clears throat> and then bend the tube back and forth until it breaks at that point without creating a burr. Wire cutting pliers will actually pinch the tubing shut. Uh, metal shavings, dirt, moisture, uh, filings, flux, or oxides from brazing can all enter a system during manufacture and installation. So just take extra care whenever you're brazing, not even just cap tubes, but whenever you're brazing your copper lines of any sort, section line, discharge line, cap tube, whatever it is, you want to take care not to get any debris, any dirt, anything inside of the um, the tubing uh, because all you want inside of your system is good clean refrigerant anything else is going to uh, give you issues and um, and the vacuum pump can only do so much so just take care whenever you open the system um, but also when changing a cap tube I don't cut them at all I've never cut one I simply sweat it out meaning I'll heat up the, uh, the 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 solder from the previous brazing and until it's melted and then I'll just pull the old one out whole and then stick the new one in the hole and and then braze that one in that way I don't have to um, run the risk of damaging my cap tube so but nowadays most of the time every like a lot of the time the metering devices are connected with flare fittings so you can you can change them out just using a couple wrenches you don't always have to braze um both are still available the uh braze type and then the uh, the um the solderless connections where you could just do it with the uh it, it's got flare nuts you could do it with wrenches uh both are still available but i'm seeing more and more of the flare fittings because it's just easier um not only easier to replace or install but it's also easier to protect the uh the the metering device because you have you don't have to worry about heating it up and overheating it or you know damaging the lines in the you know in in, in, in your effort to try to braze it or anything it's it's just a lot cleaner and easier to not have to do all that to change your metering device so anyways moving on troubleshooting capillary tubes a restricted capillary tube is a primary problem encountered on capillary tube metering devices. A restricted capillary tube will operate with a low suction pressure, a high superheat, and a high subcooling. Those symptoms right there are a dead giveaway. The restriction can be uh, from solid debris like copper shavings and copper oxide scale, or it could be from water. Sometimes the strainer ahead of the capillary tube is restricted and not the tube itself. The capillary tube is plugged with solid debris. Uh, sorry, if it's plugged with solid debris, it will have to be changed out. So the strainer on some systems, there's if the, the ones with the flare nuts, if you unscrew the nut, there'll be a strainer a lot of times right there at that point. You can pop that off and rinse it or replace it but sometimes it's not the device itself it's just the strainer which is doing its job it's catching any particulates that might want to go clog up your metering device it's catching it before that happens fixed orifice so here is the piston right here that is the one that i was mentioning earlier and uh, and there's just a tiny little orifice inside of there and it restricts the amount of refrigerant that's coming in and it, it comes out of the other end at a lower pressure uh, orifice is a three-syllable word for hole. The orifice looks like a small solid brass piston with a small hole. The two chief advantages of these metering devices are economy and flexibility, meaning they're cheap and they're easy to replace or install. Troubleshooting fixed orifice. Uh, fixed orifices can become clogged and will operate with a low suction pressure, a high superheat, and a high subcooling. Debris can also cause orifices 
to seat improperly and cause the low side pressure to be high and the superheat and subcooling to both be low. An oversized orifice will overfeed, producing high suction pressure, low superheat, and low subcooling. An undersized orifice will cause low suction pressure, high superheat, and high subcooling. Um, any orifice problem can usually be solved by recovering the refrigerant, uh, installing a new filter dryer, replacing the orifice with a new correctly sized orifice, evacuating the system, charging the system with clean refrigerant. Uh, the orifice is a fixed restriction metering device, should never be drilled out. The orifice are actually conical shaped holes that you do not have the capability to drill in the field. So basically don't try to alter the size of your orifice. If you feel like it's underfeeding, don't take out a drill bit and try to open it up. Or at least I wouldn't because I'm not an engineer. I don't know how much opening I need to do. And I'm definitely, definitely not willing to open it a little bit, evacuate my system. Uh, well, open it a little bit, put everything back together, new filter dryer, raise everything in, evacuate, charge it up, check it again, just to realize, oh, I got to get a bigger drill bit, open it up a little bit more, pull my refrigerator out. You know, I'm not doing all that. I mean, I, and then after doing it a whole bunch of times, then then you overshoot it, and now you got to change the piston anyway. Um, I don't know anybody that's went through that whole process before. If I ever meet that person, I'm going to laugh at them because that's, that's, that's just a little ridiculous. Um, anytime you need to change a metering device, change it out like for like. Pull the old one out, toss it, put another one in per that manufacturer specification. Um, if you can't get the model and serial number off the unit, if it's old and worn off, just take the old part with you to the supply house and get a matchup. up. Um, so moving on, um, automatic expansion valves. Automatic expansion valves are basically refrigeration pressure regulators. They open and close to keep a constant pressure at the valve outlet. The valve has an adjustment at the top for, uh, for setting the evaporator pressure to reduce a desired evaporator temperature, sorry, to produce the desired temperature. Uh, turning the adjustment clockwise increases the evaporator pressure. Turning the adjustment counterclockwise decreases the evaporator pressure. But don't just go turning on them before you rule out other issues that could be causing your pressure readings to be funky, like dirty coils, dirty uh, filters. So just, you know, make sure all your fans are turning and the system is doing what it's supposed to do uh, before you start adjusting the metering device. AEV responses uh, or response to load changes. Light loads cause evaporator pressure to drop. The meter then opens to pick, the, uh, to pick up the pressure and flood the coil becoming a hazard for the compressor. When the load increases, the evaporator pressure causes the valve to close, reducing the flow of the, uh, to the evaporator and increasing superheat, thereby overheating the compressor. So you gotta be careful not to overshoot it in either direction. Um, internally equalized valves. Thermostatic expansion valves must be able to sense the evaporator pressure in order to operate correctly. Uh, on, intent, on internally equalized valves, this is done with a passageway through the valve from the valve outlet to the underside of the diaphragm. <clears throat> so the TXVs have a diaphragm and there's pressure on the top of the diaphragm to open the valve when need be. And then there's pressure on the bottom side of the uh, diaphragm to close the valve when need be. So there's a spring that pushes that close, but there's also the pressure from the 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 equalizer the equalizer tube. Well, on on externally equalized uh, TXVs, you have the equalizer tube. On these ones, the the internal it doesn't have a separate tube. It has a it has an opening uh, internally on the inside that allows that uh, suction line pressure to come in to the underside of the diaphragm to keep that to, to sense that pressure uh, correctly to make sure that the uh, that the TXV operates correctly. 
So the port or line that transmits the evaporator pressure to the underside of the diaphragm is called an equalizer line. Internally equalized valves are easier to install than externally equalized valves because they don't require any connection to the suction line outside of the, the sensing bulb. Uh, since internally equalized valves measure the evaporator pressure at the beginning of the evaporator, they will not work well with evaporators that have a large pressure drop. Valve superheat setting. A lower superheat setting delivers a higher capacity by using more of the evaporator coil to boil refrigerant. The desired operating superheat decreases as the temperature difference between the evaporator and the load increases. The correct superheat for any system can only be determined by consulting in the, the uh, equipment manufacturer. Um, I don't know if I like the word only being right here because you can determine the target superheat by just checking your basic temperatures and pressures. But <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> a lot of times the there'll be a chart on the um, on the data tag somewhere that tells you your target superheat or subcool. Um, usually the superheat is somewhere between eight to twelve degrees. Um, your default cell cooling is usually 10 degrees unless there's a um, charging chart, then you wanna go by the chart. So the evaporator is a low temperature refrigeration system, or sorry, the evaporator in low temperature refrigeration systems operate as little as five degrees lower than the freezer that they are cooling. While the evaporator in an air conditioning system can be 40 degrees cooler than the air that is cooling. Low temperature freezers often operate with superheat as low as four degrees, while air conditioning systems typically have superheat settings as high as 15 degrees. Adjusting valve superheat. The superheat is adjusted by turning the valve stem in small increments to change the spring tension. The adjustment on most valves is clockwise to increase the superheat and counterclockwise to decrease the superheat because righty tighty lefty loosey. So turn it to the right, you're gonna close it off a little bit and increase the superheat. And then turn it to the left, you're gonna open it a little bit and decrease the superheat. Uh, before attempting to adjust superheat on an expansion uh, valve, make sure that, other, that some other system problems is not causing the incorrect superheat. Adjusting a valve does not need adjusting uh, Sorry, adjusting a valve that doesn't need to be adjusted will just create another problem to solve after you solve the original problem. Um, I've had that happen. I've made an adjustment, <clears throat> found the real problem, corrected that, then went back to checking everything and stuff still was off. And I was like, oh, now I had to go back and try to get the, uh, get the, get the uh, TXV adjusted back to how it was in the first place. So again, you know, check the simple stuff before you, before you make any determinations. Liquid distributors. Distributors are used to equally distribute the refrigerant to each circuit on a multiple circuit coil. Uh, they are placed between the exp expansion, the expansion valve and the evaporator. So, and you'll see it, um, I can't wait till we get back in the lab so we can have some, you know, have it right there in front of you, but there's, the inlet and then the outlet usually goes to a distributor, which is basically several tubes that go out into your evap coil and it just feeds it evenly in, you know, in, in, in the different circuits. So that's all the distributors are. TEV sizing. Factors involved in sizing include refrigerant type, evaporator temperature, pressure drop across the valve, uh, liquid temperature entering the valve, um, although most TEVs are labeled with a nominal capacity, the operating conditions used to produce this rating may not match the actual operating conditions for the system in which the valve is installed. Installing a TEV or TXV, it's the same thing. TEV stands for thermostatic expansion valve or thermal expansion valve, either or, same as TXV. Uh, so, Installing the TXV, thermostatic expansion valves should be mounted as close to the evaporator as, as practical. 
the valve body itself can be in any position. Do not overheat when brazing or soldering. Uh, the valve body can be wrapped with wet rags or heat absorbing paste to keep it cool. Uh, in particular, the power head and the bulb should not be overheated. So the sensing bulb, you definitely don't want to overheat the sensing bulb. Um, again, a lot of the new, a lot of stuff nowadays has flare fittings and you don't have to braise them when you're, when you're changing them out. The ones we have in the classroom all have flare nuts, so you can just use wrenches to, to change them out. The thing about that is you have to be sure to tighten the, the nuts enough that you don't have a leak at your uh, THV. The thermal sensing bulb <clears throat> should ideally be located on, on a clean horizontal section of the suction line and as close to the evaporator as possible. The bulb is normally mounted at four or eight o'clock uh, positions on the suction line uh, that are seven eighths inches in diameter or larger. The sensing bulb should never be located on the bottom of the suction line. Liquid and oil can puddle at the bottom of the line and affect the temperature on the bottom of the line. Good thermal contact is essential for the valve to operate correctly. So basically, you don't want you don't want it on the bottom because liquid can collect on the bottom. You want it, like they say, you know, four or eight o'clock. And that way you're not getting just that solid liquid temperature. You're getting the temperature of the uh, vapor. Excuse me. And um, so it's always gonna be four or eight. Usually some manufacturers do have different specifications and you just go by their specifications. I've seen them mounted at 12 o'clock before. Um, but again, it, you know, it, it does vary from one manufacturer to another, but typically it's going to be four or eight o'clock. You want that sensing bulb to be well insulated. So on some systems, like the ones we have in class, the sensing bulb is mounted inside of the evaporator cabinet. So it's not insulated because it's in a closed cabinet, which itself is insulated. So all the air inside of there is, is uh, the, the temperature of that air is, is contained. But a lot of times the sensing bulb is mounted on the suction line outside of the cabinet. And like, and you have to mount it yourself. When you get your coil, it'll be zip tied to the outside of the coil and it's up to you to mount it. So that's when you have to make sure you put it at four or eight o'clock and then you wanna use their um, clamp. They'll, they always come with a copper clamp. You don't want to bypass that and throw it and toss it to the side and just use a zip tie because it's easier. And the reason being is because of the thermal, uh, because of the heat transfer. That copper, they, they used copper to mount it for the purpose of heat transfer. It, you, you want to be able to maintain that temperature in that bowl. Um, you don't want other substances to manipulate that temperature. So you use their copper clamp, clamp it to your suction line at four or eight o'clock. And once it's all clamped, then you want to insulate it. If it's on the suction line outside of the evaporator cabinet, you want to insulate it really well so that the temperature reading inside of that sensing bulb is accurate. You don't want it picking up the, the, the warm ambient air from outside. You want it to only sense the, 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 the temperature of the refrigerant in the suction line. So it's important that it's well insulated. Uh, yeah. External equalizer connection. So again, referring to the, the systems that we have in our labs, these, those ones have the external equalizer connection, which is that extra tube you see on the, on the uh, TXV. You got the inlet, you got the outlet, you got the little coil, the little, uh, not coil, you have the tiny little uh, capillary tube on the top connected to the sensing bulb that's attached to your suction line. Then you got this whole other line that's connected to the suction line as well with a flare net. And that line is your external equalizer connection or your equalizer tube. The equalizer connection normally uh, penetrates the suction line six or eight inches downstream from the sensing bulb, unless the manufacturer's uh, instructions advise differently. Sometimes they are upstream. Uh, the equalizer line should come off the top of the suction line, never the bottom. The external equalizer line should never be upstream of this, the bulb. Uh, I've seen them upstream. Um, 
And so what that does, the same way like the internal equalizer, how it has a, a, a pathway or inside of the valve that allows the suction pressure to the underside of the diaphragm, the external equalizer tube does the same thing, but instead of having a, a, a little port inside of the valve itself, it has its own uh, tube from the suction line straight to the valve to the underside of the diaphragm. So in summary, the metering device reduces the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant entering the evaporator by restricting how much refrigerant can pass through the metering device. The two general types of metering devices are fixed and modulating. Modulating devices can adjust their flow in response to changes in the system. Fixed metering devices cannot. The, uh, the flow through a fixed metering device is not fixed, but varies with both the condenser and the evaporator temperature. So that is it for unit 15. Read your books. It's a lot more information in the book. And unit 15 has been um, assigned on FlexiQuiz, so you can go ahead and knock that out. And then also um, just wanted to say, I hope everybody is staying safe, staying home, respecting the rules, because this social distancing is it's necessary. I mean, a lot of us weren't worried before. A lot of us still aren't very worried, but the situation is very real. So just, you know, do your social distancing, stay clean, stay healthy, take your vitamins, all that good stuff, and um, and stay home, man. As you can see, I'm at home now. They, they uh, finally gave me the green light to stay home because, you know, the situation is not it don't seem like it's improving a whole lot. I, I don't know. I haven't followed the statistics as closely as I probably should have. But some of y'all, I mean, it's not a secret. We all we all see what's going on. So um, I'm at home. I hope y'all are at home too. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay studying because we're going to be back in class eventually. And when that happens, I want, you know, I want everybody, I don't want anybody to be lost. So, um, and anybody who feels lost, don't trip. I'll, I will get us all caught up. As soon as we get in there and get some face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, I can get a sense for where everybody's at and get us all on the same page. So uh, until then, stay home, stay safe, stay healthy, keep studying, and I'll see y'all on the next one. All right.